Coming up this week on the Dislodge Talk Show 898, Richard's back and we're here with Gary and we're going to be talking about new builds of Windows 11. Uh, Richard's going to be telling about how he's got on on his travels and how he's finding his new EV. We've got Space Talk, we've got Vintage Synth Talk and lots more. So let's get straight to Richard and Gary. Richard and Gary, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome back, Richard. Yes, yeah, it's been a while. It's been a couple of weeks, yeah. So you've been uh, you've been on your travels. I have, yes. I've uh, I've, I've just got back from uh, 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 Tokyo, and I also went to uh, the CNCF, the Cloud Native uh, Foundation, the KubeCon in Amsterdam. Oh, very nice. It's very it's very interesting. Actually, very interesting indeed. Uh, it was a uh, um, yeah a lot of uh, a lot of talk about AI, but also about sort of um, uh, which actually I think probably feeds into what happened last last from the show, which was about, about carbon monitoring and power monitoring, which is obviously becoming more and more important when you uh, set up these uh, cloud based uh, things, knowing exactly how much power you're using, how much carbon you're, you're putting, as well as knowing the cost as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it was it was, it was mm. a very interesting conference. Yeah, sounds it. And how was how was Japan? Uh, Japan was. Was was great. Although uh, I, I I don't know if you uh, noticed that the um, there was a problem with uh, I think it was was it Intel sat one of the satellites over the Pacific went went down, which unfortunately not went down literally. <laughs> that would be that'd be terrible. Uh, but but was knocked offline and um and that caused us problems getting back. So our our flight rather than going our direct route had to go a very circuitous route back, which took 17 hours to fly back from Tokyo to uh, to London, which was a bit brutal. <laughs> oh, and why would the satellite affect the, the flights? Is that because of the tracking and everything? I gather it's a tracking. We flew back on British Airways and they had two problems. One, they couldn't get the they couldn't download the flight loading information apparently. And the other problem was, yeah, tracking basically. They they they, they needed to, to be in, in contact with the satellites and um unfortunately um they couldn't be. So there we go. And did you see any interesting tech while you were out in Japan? I didn't really know. I did go in the arcades and played some games that I played about <laughs> 10 years ago. But apart from that, no, no, unfortunately not. I mean, the last, I remember the first time I was in Japan, it must have been around the 2012 Olympics because I can remember going there and, uh, and the 4K TVs were all rolling out. So I was very impressed there with that. But uh, I didn't get a chance to actually go into any of the big uh, electronic superstores this time. So uh, just just really went there for the the cherry, cherry blossom and uh, and, and, and just uh, visiting my eldest daughter, who's uh, working out there as a translator and interpreter. So um, uh, it was great, though. Really, really good. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic country. I'd, I'd recommend anyone who gets a chance to, to, to visit it because it's, it's just, you know, it's uh, it's I, I still can't get over the toilet seats. Even now, I'm still freaked out by the toilet seats. <laughs> <laughs> And I think until you've been there and experienced the Japanese toilet seat, you, you you won't know what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, or the or the the automated beer r- r- robots also very fun as well. It's a place I've never been. I would like to go. I've, I've been to China, but never been to Japan. Uh, oh, I highly uh, recommend it. Yeah, be, be, yeah, it's really good, really good. Actually, yeah, it's it's, it's a great country and uh, and really uh, yeah, a very friendly uh, people as well. So mm. uh, yeah, very helpful uh, and 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 the food's excellent. So and it's handy having your own interpreter to take along with you. Well, yes, yes, my eldest <laughs> is pretty fluent, so it's, it was. I just said, "Can you ask him this?" And away she should go. Okay, uh, in, in, because I've got, well, obviously in Tokyo, there's many people, people there that will actually speak English. Uh, mm. But as soon as you, you venture out, out of the big city, then it's uh, it goes a lot more rural, and uh, and you become much more of a um, of a novelty. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. But yeah, well, a great place. Although, yeah, well, interestingly, uh, uh, one top tip would would be. Bear in mind, your phone probably won't work out there. You, you, you should buy a SIM at the airport because um, uh, if you try and use your phone while it will work, you'll be charged an absolute fortune yeah. to use it. Uh, it's insane how much, how, how much it costs. So yes, uh, uh, I, I would recommend anyone going looks very carefully at their phone and considers buying a SIM at the airport for not yeah. much money. Yeah, that's it's, it's the roaming charge, isn't it? They just um, they just it, it's it's in pounds per bytes not megabytes in my, <laughs> but but it seems to be pounds yeah. per bytes and even things like receiving a call and stuff it's just you know it's it's, it's like going back years and you think Craig, i remember how, how bad this was before to to, to, you know, to receive calls in europe or the us mm. or whatever and and of course it's in japan it's like wow it really is like it's going to cost you one pound fifty two pounds just to have someone phone you so wow. yeah <laughs> it's expensive expensive hobby however again i'll say it's a great place it's it's really good uh and and uh I'm hoping to go back in a few more in a few years' time to again visit uh, fan family out there. 
Yeah, oh, well, brilliant. Well, we're glad you had a good time. Uh, we, we'll let you off for having those two weeks off the show. You won't get paid for them, though. So. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> hey, well, actually, we'll pay you the same rate as we normally pay. Don't worry. Oh, that's good. Holiday pay. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's very yes, generous. Very generous. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, we'll give ourselves a big bonus. Uh, yeah, we had a, a, yeah, we had a good show last week. Dan Caesar from uh, Fully, yes, Charged Fully Charged Life. Life. Yeah. yeah, that was a good show. That So we enjoyed talking to Dan. Yes, I, 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 it's a shame, wasn't it? Because I, I would have harangued him about my my EV experience so far. So, <laughs> well, while we're on that, then, talk about that. Yeah, give us an update. How are you doing with yours? Uh, okay, well, so far, um, uh, the uh, I would say there's this case of lies, damn lies, and ranges would be the first thing I'd say. <laughs> uh, which is, you know, of course, the car is very, very smart, and we'll, and we'll recalculate how long, how far things you can go based on your driving style. And certain drivers in the household drive in a very enthusiastic fashion the car saying well if you drive that way i'm not going to go as far which is taking a while to actually understand i think um i would say the main issue i've had so that there sounds two main issues car itself has been brilliant um public charging has been a problem definitely a problem uh, because there's not enough fast chargers out there i'm, I'm realizing now there's there's very few fast chargers and, and the ones there are are hideously expensive again gary please correct me if i if, if i misunderstood that but it's uh that's what it seems to be at the moment and the finding one that's one working and two will be a fast charge because of course the last thing you want is a, a type two charger because that's going to take hours to charge up whereas mm. a fast charger can give you a big chunk of charge in half an hour or so which is really what you want and there's not that many of those around from what i can see at least not on the routes i'm going on which is to the west country and to norfolk and things so there's there's a few around Norfolk way, but yeah, the, the, I mean, it depends which way you where you're coming. Um, but the and and, they, and to be fair, the Norfolk is starting to grow. West Country, yes, that's a little bit more challenging. There have been a, Australia have been putting a few, quite a few in recently. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cost, I can't argue with that. The cost is way too high at the moment. It, it, it is due to start dropping. I'm hearing rumours from a couple of the suppliers that they're actually going to start dropping the cost. I mean, obviously, one advantage you've got. Because you've got a Kia, is you have got the Kia Charge Card, um, which I assume you've got. Yep. And there, and there are various subscriptions on there which can reduce the price of Ionity, which you can't, I'm not sure if you've got Ionity down there. There's certainly an Ionity on the way down to the West Country, um, which, which could be useful. Yeah. Um, so, so, so basically, it's a case of you know one one has to plan and think quite carefully where one's going. You do at the moment, and 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 that is the big, the, still the big issue. I mean, infrastructure has been the issue. It's not. It's never never been range anxiety for me it's been charger anxiety if anything i think the range of the cars is fine and as you say as long as you're not too enthusiastic and it sounds like someone's been very enthusiastic with their driving <laughs> then uh, then uh, then ranges should be reasonable to manage but i do well, i do agree yeah i mean i would say that's one of the problems with evs full stop is it's very easy to drive it like a normal car because it is like having a performance normal car yeah yeah, yeah. if you yeah. if you're quite heavy on the on the right foot they really go fast and uh well, and, and, well i i mean i think the thing people have to have to realize is if you drive a, a an ev at, at its full potential you are driving the equivalent of what would have been a supercar five years ago yeah oh yeah it's uh, i mean and, and again i can't complain about the car at all the cars we brilliant and, and i've i have read the manual and i now understand what the bings and bongs mean so that's that's good the other problem i've had as well um and it's kind of one of those things that it's a problem but i've been very impressed by the service is um is my home charging set setup so i've got, got a uh, an omi home pro uh charger at home and uh my supply is octopus energy so this is probably quite uk specific now uh and <clears throat> octopus do a thing called intelligent octopus where um it'll kind of only yeah. feed through charge and it's currently i think about seven and a half percent per kilowatt hour which is really cheap uh and it's it, so so i can get the car fully charged for you know a few pounds really it's great um yeah. and, and they've just dropped the price on that haven't they? Octopus, yeah, that's one of them well a few energy supplies have actually dropped costs it, it has just come down yeah I mean, it's i mean and 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 i have noticed actually um the difference between having having a, an internal combustion engine car versus electric car it's noticeably cheaper at the moment um as long as i charge at home however um i've had a lot of problems with the um, get, getting the charger to spot to recognize the octopus, I've I've had to do power cycles to get the charger to actually go online and be recognized by the network. Lots and lots of teething issues, which uh, been, uh, I've been told by the charge charging. Oh yes, yeah, you 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 try to set things up that way. 
yes, the, the screen say you should do that. Don't do that because there's a bug. You know, so it's like you must use an email address password. You must use Apple or Google authentication because that is a bug which stops things working. There's been a lot of teething trouble around it. However, one thing I would say is uh, the service I've received from both Octopus and uh, Omi has been incredible. I mean, really impressively good uh, in, in a huge human being has got back to me within hours or minutes when aware and I've had issues and said, okay, do this, do that. Really helpful advice. And I'm up and running. So I would say it hasn't been as straightforward as I would have hoped, uh, getting it working at home to charge at home. However, um, the service from the company's concern has been very, very impressive. So, um, and 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 uh, it, it, service that involves a human being actually talking you through how to how to do stuff, which is really helpful. I think certainly people who might be alarmed or confused. I mean, obviously, I'm sure people who listen to this are very familiar with technical stuff, uh, but somebody who perhaps is, is, is less au fait with uh, you know apps and things would find it very very straightforward to make work so uh i'd say it's been a bumpy month <laughs> so far the next big test gary is going to be this weekend where it's going to go on a long journey which involves planning the charging so what are you, what are you using to plan your charging your charging uh zap it i think i'm using zap it to, to identify where, where they are the car itself that, will, yeah the car itself will in theory do it uh but i yeah. don't think it's it's as up to date as, as the zap map stuff is so no I'll, i mean you do I'll, need to you need to make sure it's updated. I mean, you should get you should be getting over the air updates for that in that car, but um, if oh, not, yeah. not really. I mean, in theory, but I, you know, it's um, the the it, it means using the the, the in car nav navigation system, which bless it is is here maps, which is fine. But when you're very used to using Google Maps or or, or things through Car CarPlay, it's like stepping back a generation in some ways, which <laughs> I'm sure here maps fans would, would would be very aggrieved about. But it does feel like a a different level. But um. Yeah, I, uh, I must admit because I've I've obviously got the similar nav, nav to you in the, in the EV6, and yeah. what what I've actually been doing of late is not actually planning my routes. I, I I've used the, the find nearest EV charger once I get down to 100 miles um, of range, which then usually gives me enough enough juice to get to, to where wherever charger it happens to suggest. Are you keeping um, your battery at around 80 percent, or do you do you juice it up to the to, to, to max? I, for long journeys, I'll go to max. I mean, if you're slow charging, there's no, there's absolutely, I mean, this whole thing of 80% comes from the old Tesla days when they, they exactly, didn't yeah. have any battery, battery management. Battery management now, nowadays is great. And, and if it's slow charging, there's no point in, no worries at all going to 100%. Fast charge, rapid charging, rapid charging is a slightly different matter. And I wouldn't push it past the, um, what rapid charging, I would say, it, it, once the, once the charge, dro charge rate drops, when the battery can't cope with the speed of the charging anymore and more, that's the time to pull away. And it depends on the car that what that is. In the the key, it's around about eighty five percent. Okay, fine. That's okay. So because I mean, I mean, slow charge ch charging. Yeah, you know, one one wants to kind of always start with with hundred percent after after slow charge. And and uh, I mean, looking at, at, at how rapid charging works anyway, it will do eighty percent, I think, on DC and then switch to AC for the the remain for a slow charge. Well, no, it it doesn't switch to AC. What it does, it just slows the DC charge down. So basically, it, it, you, so the, the best analogy I've ever heard of, of, of rapid charging is think of it like a cinema or a theatre filling up. In the early early bit of charging, it's lots of places for people to get in, but as as you get as it fills up, it takes it, there's more less and less space, and it takes longer to find the space. And that's basically what's happening with the battery. It's it's it's, it's, it's more difficult for it to charge fill up, and as you rub against more and more people, there's more and more friction and it starts getting out. Well, everybody starts getting a bit angry and it gets a bit hot. Um, so so it wants to it basically slows down the charge to try and try and avoid, avoid that happening. Um, and that, that's basically what it does. It doesn't switch to AC as such. Um, it just carries on DC, but it, but it's a slower. Way. But you have to remember that all, all DC charging um, or AC charging actually goes DC inside anyway. It's converted. So it's a. Uh, um, and and that's why why some cars have limits on how fast they can AC charge because it depends on on the, the the conversion rate that the car can actually do. So some cars are 11 kilowatts, some are 22 kilowatts, but um, but that doesn't really help us in the UK that much with 22 kilowatts. There's a very few well, 20 quite a few kilowatt AC chargers. I'll let you know next Tuesday how it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, got conversations on on planning. Zap, it, Zap Maps pretty good, um, but it's not always as up to date. As some of the other ones are these days. I think there's a few few networks which don't give it as much information. Um, a, a better route planner is really good at, at planning routes based on your actual car performance. It knows most of the cars, but it also take, you could also pay a premium and take into account weather, weather as well. Weather can be a big factor on charging. 
um it's how, how fast you need to go um the other thing is is it's really worthwhile getting your charge down to a low level before you start charging mm-hmm. um because if you if you if you've driven a long way your battery's warm and it's at low low state charge around about 10 15 20 percent mark it'll actually charge faster to 80 percent than it will from 30 percent of charge or 40 percent of charge it's just it's just um science basically the fact that if the battery's warm, it charges faster, basically. Um, but though you may have the preheat option on yours, it actually one of the advantages of using the navigation on the on it the satellite. It will preheat, yeah, yeah. It will preheat, yes, which is really useful. Um, so that you means you don't have to worry about it quite so much. So, so you're so you're rec- rec- recommending BB Brave and use the, the inbuilt sat nav. Well, because, because you, can, it, you can use because, it. You can use it at the same time as using other nav sat navs that have a navigation. That's, <laughs> You see, the, the the real test here is it's not going to be me driving this. It's going to be um, <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's who's going to be taking yeah, the car. And, and she's yeah. going to basically get to a charge point, plug it in, work out how to make it work. She's not going to be able to use the key charge stuff. So <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. Well, well, you could, it's probably probably worth applying for actual key charge card as well as the app, because the app's a bit of a nightmare to use. But the card charger, actually, card, char- card is actually really easy to use in most places. You just tap against the yeah. contactless brain. Mm-hmm. And that's yep. the same for virtual virtual EVs are part of a network of something for charging. BMW have it, Mercedes have one, and VW have one as well. Um, I think MG is about the only one I know who are who not and don't have to supply their own charge card. Um, and I'd always recommend actually getting the physical card. Make life a little bit easier. But to, but you can use contactless in most places these days. It's not, it's not it just doesn't get a discount rate. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I found. I, I, I've done one bit of a uh, uh, on-street charging because um, when it's gone up to west to west London, we've, 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 there's loads and loads of type type two uh, charge 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 drugs in the street. So we've used those of those a few, a few times, and they've been ridiculously easy to use. I mean, really, really simple uh, and uh, yeah, really clear when we you know, when they're, they're working when when they're not working. And um, it's just been a case of uh, I mean, I think with one it was a case of scanning a QR code and then pressing go, and that was it. That was it. There was, mm-hmm. there, there, there was nothing. I mean, it, it then th- went through Apple, Apple Pay on the phone, but there was no e- no effort re- required at all. It was mm. Very straightforward. Yeah, I mean, you know, most of them nowadays are getting a lot easier to use than they were a few years ago. But I still find a few. I mean, I was uh, at a place the other day which has a had an Eon, Eon Type Two charger, and I, was, I couldn't work out how to get the work. I was scanning the app, and it was coming up saying this this charger is already in use. Um, and you can't start charging on it, and I thought, but it's not in use. I'm I've plugged into it. I'm not I'm not one. And then I thought I plugged into it, so I unplugged it and tried it again. And it said, oh, you can start charging now. <laughs> so you, you yeah you sometimes sometimes gets the complications like that, but uh, yeah it's, it's um it's fun fun these things. But I think the, the, the main thing is, is if you plan ahead, you can you can you can get and go to the sort of chargers which are known. Good brands like like Osprey, um, Ionity, uh, Good Serve, Good Serve. Those those ones are, are usually very easy to use on, on on rapid charging. Some of the others are maybe not. GD Point is a little bit more challenging to use. Um, so it, it's it, most most of the other ones are pretty pretty straightforward. Cool. As I say, it's uh, it's we've been fine. And 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 thanks for the tip about the the it's okay to to, to fully charge it because I, I you know I've been Worn all kinds of doom things saying, "Oh, you must never put more than eight, eight, eight percent in." Eight, 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 eight. Yeah, I mean, I, that I mean that is really historic, and a lot of people still yeah. still quote it. Um, one of the things you have to remember is that eighty percent on virtually every single modern EV car battery is not eighty percent of the battery. It's about sixty percent of the battery because one hundred percent of the battery isn't eighty isn't one hundred percent. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, I've I've yet to 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 to, to drain it completely to see how far it will go. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, mine I know know will do twenty miles after it's got to zero. <laughs> I, you know what? I really don't want to find that out. <laughs> I was going to say, what happens if you get to zero and it and it, and it runs out? So, what, what it'll first do is it will go into reduced power mode. So, what, what used to be called rabbit mode, but it, it's a, or turtle mode. So, so, so you, sorry, turtle mode. Rabbit mode is the actual mode when you're running quite happily, and turtle mode is when you're not running happily. Um, but turtle mode's got, kind of gone out of fashion as as a, as a phrase. Um, but yeah, so reduced power mode come, will come on, and you get a warning, on, and and then you can't accelerate as fast and all that sort of stuff, and that aches out a few more miles off the battery, um, and eventually it will post to a stop, just the same as a petrol car would if it ran out of fuel. 
and and all you need to be able to do is get some charge in it into it somehow um in most cases when i've got really low i've been actually, i've been quite close to a charger it's me, me being stupid and trying to uh to, to go go beyond where, where i should have been going because the prediction i mean this this used to be more of a problem in older evs the the actual um prediction meters the range meters were were totally inaccurate and um, they, they got named guesso meters because they were so so inaccurate at the time, times um but now, nowadays the clear ones particularly are really good at being accurate um as to what you're obviously taking into account a heavy feet feet and the like and they will adjust as you go on so you, you can get um, by, by midway into a journey you usually know where, how much range you've got left and, and you can be pretty good on prediction and that's why why i sort of take the view that once i get down to about 40 percent charge i'm starting to look for a charger um normally um in also my older cars and certainly on the ipace i have run it run that really down down to zero, almost zero quite a few times because i was the prediction wasn't very good but the really, six is pretty very good and, and the only time i got it very low was when i when i had i think about 40 miles range left I, and I had four charges on the route and I decided I was going to press on to the last one. And that was totally by my stupid judgment. You stopped at the first one. It would have been a lot safer. But um, I just I just fancied the restaurant at the last one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so I, I did that and I got there, but, but it was it was squeaking. I, 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 I just had to dive on a bit. But yeah, <laughs> I would recommend that. Especially no. not, not, for, not for other people in the car who drive in the car. Yeah, and it, and it's, of course, it's the same applies to petrol, doesn't it? We've all done it. With it does. It does. I, I, I'll, I'll fill up the next station. And I think everybody has a different level of range tolerance as well. And I think that that's the, the, the case with petrol cars as well. I mean, I, I know people who who absolutely are terrified if they get below 100 miles range on the car. Um, um, or I, I also know people who, who who will never let their petrol car drop below half a tank, just in case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. I've, I've done it as well. I think. Well, I can get to work and back and then fill up. But it's only the same yeah. thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I I tend to be quite good with my devices, like my phone and things, and I regularly charge them. And you know, yeah. So, uh, you know, some people are terrible, aren't they? And, you know, always need. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite terrible, terrible with my car because because I know mm-hmm. it's got a lot of range. So I know I've got all these little quick short short jaunts jaunts around the week. So I probably only charge it once a week, mm-hmm. and I probably should probably should charge it slightly more just now. I've got a little bit of leeway, but yeah, most of the time I can get. I mean, I know know where I am in Peterborough. I, I'm 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 two minutes from from a load of charges. Um, in fact, a load more charges going in this week. I spotted mm-hmm. there, there's just putting another charger down just down the road from me. So, um, so if the worst comes to worst, I can always charge it uh, uh, rapid um, if I've forgotten to charge on the on the Type Two, which would be really silly because, as Richard says, it's a lot cheaper to charge when you're on on the the uh, the Type Two charger yeah. at home, um, and that's the way to do it if you can do that. Um, and if you haven't got as heavy a foot as some people have got, <laughs> which have been, been, I mean, the point the point I was making about being a supercar. If you if you think about what the petrol consumption is on a supercar, mm. I mean a lot of them do ten miles to the gallon or twelve miles to the gallon. You that's what you're getting, and I mean you're getting way better than that on an EV. But but you are it's it's that sort of equivalent in terms of performance. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. I mean you don't get anything for free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, we'll see how Richard gets on there. Uh... On next week with his, when we find out how we give with his trip next week. Yeah, well, I, I've got I've got a long trip coming up this weekend as well because obviously I'm going to fully charge. So oh yes, going, right, yeah. I'm, so I've got a really busy car weekend actually because I'm going to fully charge on Friday. I've got to come back because I've been, been, been invited to Aston Martin in Milton Keynes on on Saturday, and, and then I'm going back to fully charge on the Sunday, so, which is sort of two ends of the country really. It's it's not the yeah. But, so I think I've got I think over, I'm probably doing 500 miles in total this weekend in one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> That'll be interesting. And I'll be going somewhere to I'm going to Hulker Hall and Gardens in the Lane District. So. Oh, <laughs> yes. And you right. don't have to change your route. No, uh, but I will fill up before I leave. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we got some uh, builds last week. Not a huge amount to. Um, Going through onto those, but uh, we did. We got uh, two uh, builds last week uh, for insiders on the dev channel. 
So we got share my screen. Out. Um, so yeah, we got uh, two three four four zero and two two five three four six, and still get this weird thing where dev channel builds are getting features before Canary, which is the I I thought they would be the other way around, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So last week's dev chat, last week's Canary build got some of the features that we talked about a few weeks ago like the present sensor um there was another one i can't remember off the top of my head um hdr when running on battery that kind of thing so these were um in the uh, canary build last week but i think we had them two weeks ago in the dev build but dev build supposed to be the bleeding edge builds and the complete new features but it does it's a funny way around we're getting those at the moment it's all very odd now, I, I, I still think that they cleared the deck for the Canary builds for the next version of Windows, be it Windows 12 or whatever, or Windows 11, 24, H1, or whatever they decide to, to, to call it. Uh, I, I, I still think there's, there's a chance that uh, we'll get that. Uh, I was going to check, actually, I forgot. I think it was like October, November, before Windows 11, when we got the first announced, and then it was released that spring. So we still got some while before we... Even if they did have a new OS due next year before we can find out about that. Um, but yeah, so that's that's why I still think it. So the dev channel did pick up um, a, 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 some things like, um, well, there's a what's new in the build and there's some network diagnostic tools and things like that, but not a huge amount in the dev channel builds last week either. Uh, we also got a beta build and it's actually sometimes the beta builds are getting features that neither of the other channels have had which is the opposite way around again you'd think but uh, i don't think there was too much in this build it was just a, a few fixes uh, that were in this build um, i think it's available now for arm devices as well um, richard are you back now yes i yes, am yeah. That. yeah 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 okay i just uh, talking arm devices have you got your um how you're doing with your arm device have you got builds on there the dev kit yeah well it's getting uh, get getting builds yeah I mean, it's it's overall quite a frustrating device um because still having some weird issues with the clock at the moment and uh, and issues with display so um yeah i'm i'm not sure how seriously microsoft's really taking it. i mean i, I, I mean I, I saw the rumors about the the arm base uh, surf, surface goes but yeah yeah that sure how seriously Microsoft is really taking Windows and ARM anymore. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's the dev kits appeared, and it it's one of those things where obviously it, it was a first gen, and so you know, but it's not really improved as quickly as I would have, as I would have hoped it would have done. So um, maybe I'm being unduly negative there, but certainly it's a uh, it's not been a great experience. I have to say, running Windows and ARM is still a happier experience on my Mac instead of my Windows dev kit, which is completely rational mm -hmm. and logical. <laughs> but there we go. Yeah, and the rumours were that there's a Surface Go 4, I think it will be, one that the, an ARM-based device due out later this year or possibly even next year, uh, which the dev kit maybe is what's you know driving that development or at least the dev kit's there for developers to test their applications. But if, if they release a Surface Go, it's fine releasing a dev kit you know, device, but you know, when they release exactly, a Surface yeah. Go, it's... Um, you know, that's a work. consumer device, isn't it? Then it's a yeah. budget uh, as far I mean, as service I, goes. I mean, I'm, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, have you have you two heard anything about how it's going with the um? Uh, is it the Surface Pro? Uh, is it the Surface Pro X or yes? This, they've now merged the the, the Pro yeah. lines, yeah, yeah, haven't they? So I don't know how what the sales you know, uh, breakdown is for, for, between the ARM based Pros and the Intel based Pros because everyone I know is going down the Intel route at the moment, or, or seems to be just because of compatibility and performance issues yeah i think i've not heard and i've not seen many of the uh, those is surface pro 9 isn't it that you can get the arm version yeah. and yeah i've not seen many out in the wild and and, and that really the, the the arm based surface go apparently there will be a, an intel version as well so it's not like microsoft you know fully bring all in yeah yeah the he hedging the bets perhaps which is a shame really because because again if you, if you look at what what apple's done with the mac where well, they basically shoved everything i mean obviously they've got their own architecture or whatever else uh 
it's you, you kind of would hope if Microsoft was serious about winning the win, Islam, they'd push it harder, particularly you know in, through their own devices. But they just don't seem to be. Uh, but there we go. I mean, as, as, as I say, I, I began my my dev kit experience very positive and happy with, with, with the thing that as time's gone by, it's become more and more frustrating. And I find it just find it baffling that I'm getting better performance running Windows mm -hmm. in a VM on a Mac than I am getting on native hardware, which just seems to be wrong, to be honest. It, sh it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. Um, and uh, also part one of the reasons why the the rumor of the why the Surface Go ARM based one won't be till later in the year is because Microsoft are waiting for an ARM, or I think uh, whoever's developing the chip, the system, the Qualcomm, isn't it? Uh, is waiting for that chip to be the the right one for the launch. So maybe that's the reason. And could you know, be, yeah. Be I mean, certainly the the dev dev dev, dev kit is hardly a uh, cutting edge ARM tech. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We need a new dev kit if they do that. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I think it's, it it should be good because it's got lots of memory. It's got a colossal uh, uh, SSD, the SSD in it. It's it, it's a pretty bit. It's it's, it's great. It's great. It should be a great bit of kit. But and I would have hoped Windows and I would fly on it. But it's just it's all right. It's it's kind of it's all right. And I could now fully understand why they did not release it for consumers. But when yeah. they, if they were to do an ARM based Pro, uh, uh, sorry, ARM based Go, they would need to make it a lot better than it is now. I suppose the use case on a small tablet is there's less power hungry applications. I mean, a, a, a Go is going to be used for well, one note. And... It's, it's less power hungry until you run any kind of Intel apps on there. Yeah. And yeah. Then it, and, and then it just, it, it, it rinses the, the, the battery. You know, it's, it's, you might as well have an Intel based machine at that point yeah. because it's, it's going to actually accept you'll have worse performance and the battery gets, gets, gets munched through. So, you know, as long as you stick to, to, to native ARM. Uh, I'm trying to think where have we heard this before about Microsoft tablet that, that runs much better with native ARM. Would that be the original Surface RT, perhaps? <laughs> it would, yeah. I still love my original Surface RT. Yeah, so do I, I. Yeah. I liked it too. I really did, uh, and particularly the second gen, which was faster. And yeah, it was it was great because it was locked down. Nothing could go wrong with it. Uh, it was a brilliant little machine. I was, I was, but people didn't understand that you couldn't run obviously all your apps and things on it, which is less of an issue now. However, it's still there are still problems. Yeah, but there we go. Oh, uh, uh, I'm talking of uh, things that Microsoft got rid of, especially on the smaller side. Did you see last week? I got my uh, Sony UMPC up and working. I did see that. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, well uh, done, you. Yeah, I got I've got the camera working on it as now as well, and the fingerprint reader. <laughs> so it's got Vista on it with fingerprint reader camera. I think I've basically got everything working on it now, uh, apart from the fact that. Uh, Vista isn't really that well supported anymore. No, no, it's. Uh... <laughs> I, I did. I did like a sarcastic tweet, or not? You know, sarcastic. And this is how internet communications lose their. Sometimes can lose the subtlety. But I did a tweet. It's like, oh, I can't get Windows 11 working on my 16-year-old UMPC. And a few people replied back to me on Twitter saying, well, "What do you expect? It's 16-year-old." I was, I was trying to be funny. <laughs> I, yeah, I wasn't actually seriously upset that I couldn't <laughs> install Windows 11 on a on a 16 year old uh, UMPC. Um, I was I was I was a bit gutted I couldn't get Windows 11 on it, but yeah, that's those 64 bit only pesky requirements. Yeah, I was quite annoyed. I can remember being annoyed. It must have been about 12 years ago when I couldn't get. It must have been, was it Win? It was either Windows 8 or with, yeah, I think it was Windows 8 wouldn't work on 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 on, on a netbook on an old Samsung netbook that, 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 that I had. Which I was very mm. grieved about, and it's, it, I, don't, I don't know why I was trying to decide like, why are you even trying to do this. <laughs> yeah, actually, and I did when I was up in the loft. I did find my old Acer Aspire uh, netbook, so I think that's my next challenge. Uh, UMPC is on the shelf at the top there, but uh, yeah, that's my next. One. But I, I, I was uh, the, the, my young apprentice in the office was was really excited. I thought it was, it was absolutely brilliant, and he wanted to buy one. <laughs> You're a bit late to the market, although he was yeah. he was at school when this came when they came out. I suppose. They were still the, great um, computers. They were. I mean, the yeah, they form were, factor yeah. is just amazing. They are great. I mean, do you remember the um the uh what was it, it uh, HP did, did did a thing with Windows 3.1, didn't they? Where it was all um embedded in the in in the machine and it had a, a mechanical mouse that popped out the side that, oh, that, yeah. that, right. Do you that? the first the first one i remember is the toshiba ones the first the libretto. libretto that's yeah, the right. one yeah, yeah. I think we had two of those you know what? I'm just about, I've, I've got one of those around so, so, so somewhere they were great especially with the little thumb 
thumb mouse yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. fantastic they were. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Items. I totally blown a, lot, away. a lot of these small computers are now becoming collector's items, I noticed on, on eBay. Prices are not like anything. Yeah, I think that UMPC, I think I saw it at 600 quid on on eBay. And I was going to chuck it out, to be honest. And that, but So now it's it's now living on the shelf there. <laughs> I I regret at the moment, really regret um, uh, some of the old PC stuff. The, 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 mm-hmm. the, 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 not not PC, the, the, the old games consoles that I had. I, I, I had an old wooden, uh, you know, woody Atari VCS, which oh, was... Yeah in perfect condition and uh, and my uh, I, I went to university and when i came back my parents had had, 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 had basically had a clear out and they'd cleared everything so that was all gone uh, i had a load of star wars action figure stuff gone and every now and again i, I, I just like to to, 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 my, to, to my dad say you, you know that star wars stuff i had thousands now worth thousands <laughs> uh, and, and, um talking of retro tech actually this is Another div- uh, thing I was going to get rid of, I was thinking of getting rid of my Korg Karma. Um, it's 2001 synthesizer, but I did it, uh, some stuff for video and, and actually reminded myself how, how good it was. So this is a video about the Korg Karma MOS DSP synthesizer. That uh, So this board fits in the, the Korg synthesizer, but it's a physical modeling synthesizer. And actually it's based on this oasis pci card mm-hmm. that uh, look at the size of that card a full-size card that went into your that's a not it's the it's the old scott school expansion port in the oh in the PC, yeah isn't it yeah uh, so you'll put that in there you've got your joystick port which you could then connect your midi to and it's got optical uh, output on there as well but the mm-hmm. idea and the one i've got is the board that fits in the synthesizer so it's not the the, the standalone like that but it's a physical modeling and physical modeling it i remember watching it once i think it was on t- t- tomorrow's world or something like that is this is so a lot of synthesizers. so if you want a trumpet sound and you've got a high-end device now or using software it's a sample and it's multi-sample. It might be gigabytes worth of sounds that have been recorded, digitally recorded of a trumpet. And that's how you get a trumpet sound. But what this uh, MOS technology did was it's physical modeling where it would actually, in, in a DSP, it would emulate how a trumpet makes it sound through a, the embouchure and through the bell, you know, the, the mouthpiece of it. So you've got all those parameters and then it, you end up with a trumpet type sound, but you've got full control over it. There's... Um, a plucked model where you can say where the bridge is, so where the pickups are, or um, All right. if you do it with a bow, you can say how the, the bow is and where the bridge near, is near the bow and all this kind of thing. So it's it's not it's not a sample, it's a digital recreation. It's a model, physical model. Um, and this technology has kind of been, an, and it's kind of been a bit forgotten, I think, now, especially with, with sampling and everything else. But um, Yes, yeah. Um, so anyway, so this that's what this card did. So I did um so I did a video on this. It took me ages to do, but yeah, it's a bit got a bit of a rabbit hole. So um yeah, this this synthesizer is quite unique really. So there was there wasn't a huge amount of these made, but they, they were an add-on to a fairly the you know, the core Triton range was sold thousand hundred thousand units, so it's not like it's a rare thing, but uh yeah, I went through it and, and uh, it, it started out as someone on the gear space, one of the music device for him say you should do a video on that because there's not much about it so there you go so i've done that so um yeah so have a look at that i've got uh, a video of, of that modeling technology and how it works and then uh, i've got another one due out as well because this core karma that uh, i was talking about actually has a um actually has a oh, just played the video i'm not going to play the video um this the core, interesting about this core karma it has a almost ai like uh, generator uh for playing patterns so uh if you can get things on a synth i call it i call it an arpeggiator so you hold down a c chord it'll break the notes up and that you know arpeggiator is used by duran duran and you know all those 80s kind of repetitive things but this has something called uh, karma which is uh takes all these inputs about how how hard you press the key what key you're in um what the preceding notes were and it has 100 and it then generates these notes so a guitar will generate a pattern like a guitarist 
so anyway so i've got a special video on that as well against all 2001 technology kind of never really took off but uh, yeah i shall be talking about that on this on this video so it's rabbit holes so I'm, I'm holding up something which is slightly less um, sophisticated, but I was looking at the loft earlier. <laughs> Do you recognise one of those? Oh, what is that? That's a Casio. There you go. That's the Piano one. module. That's a bit like that yes. one. That one I've got off over there, but it's a Yamaha yeah. one. So, oh, slightly, slightly cheaper at the time. I mean, this this was, uh, I think it was 199 pounds, isn't it? Isn't it? When it was new, but it's it's, um, it's basically one of the original. Um, I think it was 12 bits sampling. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's, at the time, I thought it was brilliant. The piano sounded great yes. <laughs> compared to everything else I tried. But uh, size of yeah. it as well. And it's a massive box of what it is. Yeah. Actually, you open it up, and it's got one little tiny board. It's really, uh, yeah. I mean, most of the bottom of it was taken up by a big nine volt battery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, oh, that, that was, was brilliant. Solid. Was it, but was it, it did, have, did have MIDI in and through, but but the crazy yeah. thing about this is you couldn't switch the, the note patterns over MIDI. You, you it only responded to to, to the the MIDI play um, on yeah. button, the velocity button, the you know, commands. It didn't actually do any anything except do, do anything else. And the other thing I loved about it, it has this little tune knob on the back. It's like it's samples. It's you, sample. Yeah, why would you need to tune a digital <laughs> instrument? Yeah, I mean, I can understand, on a, you know, on something with analog circuitry, but yeah. yeah. I suppose that would be maybe to tune with your not so digital circuits to make it, yeah, it but, match to them, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's from, I haven't, I've never seen one of those before. Yeah, they are quite rare. I mean, <laughs> I, was, I think I was, I saw, I was looking on eBay the other day, and they're actually, you can sell them for more than I actually paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah well so well, get video made then I, i'm quite enjoying doing all these videos of uh of old music <laughs> technology and it's a great way actually of getting back into things that you were probably going to get rid of if you spend some time with them you actually realize why you liked them in the first place and i kind of forgotten really um and especially with that karma it's it's not worth a huge amount in the second hour market but actually it's got especially that physical model it's got a lot of potential that if, if i actually dedicate some time to it it would be quite good so that's my that, my challenge uh yeah i like that gary i want to see a video on that one how much energy consumption does your piano module take <laughs> yeah really what don't want that. um I, I, love, I love that all the bit ebay listings describe it as a vintage, vintage piano model oh, yes what's i don't know what vintage is in terms of is there a set definition of vintage in terms of technology is it 20 us. years us i'm afraid it's us it's anything we are, we've we've used. We are vintage now. But, well, yeah, definitely, I agree on that one. Um, but like good wine, we have all aged well. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there was a final thing I wanted to uh, to catch up on. Uh, there has been some SpaceX and oh, satellite stuff, yes. launches and <laughs> rocket stuff. So we've t- talked about it for a few weeks. So I wanted to see what, what's happening in that field. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, SpaceX finally launched its gigantic uh, uh, Starship rocket, which I think is a uh, stands or stood stood past tense, very very past tense, uh, stood taller than a Saturn V. Uh, that went up from the Boca Chica uh, uh, launch complex, and I mean, lots of people have been dunking on it because obviously it blew up as it was as it was going up, but. It was a test launch, and I, I, I think the, the, the hope was if it didn't destroy the, the launch tower, they were they, they were going to be quite quite happy. And so it went up, lost six engines on the way up, I think, uh, of of the engines on on, on on its base, but still managed to, to keep going uh, before finally they lost control of its span and it exploded, or well, it tumbled and exploded, which is uh, I think that happened after a few minutes of flight. So all thought a good test. The main worrying thing about it, unfortunately, is um it it pretty much ruined i mean the yeah, the, the, the launch tower was still standing but the pad whoa because of the way it launches it, it it comes off what effectively a you know a stand and for whatever reason and i don't understand why spacex decided not to do a flame trench or any kind of deflector or anything beneath it and so this thing lit up and it, it's an incredibly powerful rocket and i think anyone with a, even a basic grasp of physics thinking well that power's gonna have to go somewhere yeah and, uh, yes. so it created a massive crater beneath where the rocket was. Blew bits of concrete and bits of debris a long, long way away. I think it may have even got as far as some nearby uh, residential areas. Uh, so 
that for me is the bigger problem. The, the rocket itself go, 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 going up and, 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 and exploding, that's fine. I'd say they, they, they proved it, it, the, 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 that it would launch and, and it would stay relatively st stable. For me, the big concern is, is the fact that, 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 that it pretty much launched the, the, the base of the rocket. And I think that the level of damage it caused um, was, I don't think anyone foresaw how bad it would be. The other problem is they only ever did a static firing, I think, at half thrust. So, you know, they yeah. went from, 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 from that to a full thrust launch. You think, well, that's, again, I, I know there are companies that likes to sort of move fast and break things, but you're talking some serious physics here. And you need to actually be a bit more responsible about what you're doing. Um, and I think they're great. It went up. It didn't blow up until it, until it got a few minutes in to fly. That was great. But I think a lot of questions have to be asked both of SpaceX and of the regulatory agencies concerned uh, as to why they didn't do a static fire uh, uh, you know, with, with, with all the engines running at a, at a higher thrust and how no one realized that it was going to blow this massive crater in the ground because it, I mean, it's every other. I mean, I can't think of another space ferry nation in the world that wouldn't have a flame trench or some form of deflector beneath it because that thrust has to go somewhere. And mm. um, so uh, they, they, would, they, they would have learned lessons. Um, but I mean, I'm a massive space nerd, as, as you know. Uh, and I did laugh a bit about um, uh, the damage that the, the NASA's SLS caused to its launch down when that went up. And that was quite amusing to see that being, uh, you know, it bent doors and things. And it was, it was, not, it was not ideal. Um, but compared to the damage this SpaceX Starship suit ships, and it, it's, it's, it's a small bit, really. It's, uh, that's done mm. some serious damage. However, you know, uh, hopefully they'll, they'll learn. Um, initially, I thought they'd be bouncing back by summer. Having now seen shots of the pad, it's like, no, they're going to have to work on what's happened there. And I think they're going to have to re-engineer how that pad works because it's just like, they, you, can't, you can't launch again without thinking harder about that. It's just, it's just not safe. I mean, it's, it's uh, aside from the fact that you can damage the rocket with things blowing, 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 blowing in, up, up into it, you are in, in an area there's, you know, it's, you, you, you simply can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the debris field, debris field was reaching far and wide, wasn't it? I mean, I, I, I read stories in, uh, initially where they were saying that, oh, the, expo the rocket exploded and, and caused debris everywhere. And then now they're just saying, oh, well, that, actually that debris all came from the launch pad. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, the rockets fell in the ocean as planned. That was fine. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's more a case of, you know, this. Do you remember that? I mean, what, what, what I keep thinking about. Do you remember, do you remember that video of the exploding whale from the seventies, where, where basically a, a dead whale washes up on the beach, and, 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 and so the, <laughs> the, the, the local government thinks, well, okay, how can we get rid of this, this dead whale? I know we'll blow it up. And so they basically load it with, with, with explosives and blow it up. And then, of course, bits of whale come raining down in a, in a colossal uh, um, ray radius. I kind of thought of that because it's like the, 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 the issue with the dead debris wasn't, as Gary says, from the rocket. It was from just bits of the launch pad that were just blown out. And it's just you, you, that's properly dangerous. And they were lucky that no one was hurt, I think. Uh, it's, yeah. You know, it's, it's... So I I wonder if part of this this idea, the idea of not having the trench was was the, was the the vision which has been quoted for these these rockets of actually being able to use them in, as well as going into space, but actually using them as compute, commuted planes effectively between cities and on Earth, where they, where they just want to land them and take them off again, which obviously can't really happen. It's just not not physically poss possible. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, that's what they were, they were trying to do. I mean, I think it's probably, you know, uh, it's 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 like many things. I mean, uh, I'll give SpaceX a lot of credit in that they are doing to do it in that in the, in the, the, the company has done things that people said were impossible. They land rockets, and and you know, 20 years ago that that, that was regarded as, as, a, as a thing you couldn't do because of, of the sheer fuel and you know, the, the amount of fuel involved. You can't land a rocket. Oh, they've just done it. So I think it's a case of, you know, they've probably looked at well, this is this is kind of the wisdom of of the ages but we did we, we do things differently here and, and away they went but i think in this case just yeah <laughs> the, the the damage i mean I'd, I'd recommend anyone has a look at the drone footage it's just the damage is incredible and then you see shots of the debris coming down and it's just i mean it's it's not bits of dirt it's chunks of concrete coming out of the sky and it's just yeah not good not good at all but mm -hmm. They'll learn, and and hopefully they've learned an important lesson here. Luckily for everyone around, it appears no one's been hurt by it. I believe, I, but I hope that's the case. Um, uh, and there's been no major property damage again, I believe. But again, um, maybe more stuff will come creeping out over the coming weeks. Uh, but they'll learn. But uh, the other space news, as of just today, um, was the uh, 
the Japanese lander, the ice space lander, which uh, that, that went up on a Falcon 9 back in December to the moon, it was supposed to land on the moon today, a few hours ago, uh, as, as we record. And it looks like it might have crashed, unfortunately. Uh, they had contact all the way down until last bit, and then they lost communications with the lander. And uh, and and at the moment, they're they're looking quite glum um, because um, they, they they lost a signal during the, the landing, and they've not been able to 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 make any contact. So this is important because it's uh, an, another private company trying to land on the moon. Uh, NASA needs private companies to do this uh, for its uh, its commercial. Uh, applications. Uh, it, uh, an Israeli company, I think it was called Bereshit, uh, the Bereshit landed that uh, failed, I think, if not last year, the year before last. Um, this one has now uh, attempted landing again. It's not worked. So I don't think, unless you know of another, there's been any private companies managed to actually make a soft landing on the moon. It's only been governments. So the uh, so US, Russia, China, I think have managed it. But unfortunately, looks like this lander, uh, which uh, again, it was a very small lander. I had some small payloads. I think it, had a, it may have had a rover on it as well, but very like, I think it's like tennis ball sized. It's very, very small uh, rover as well. Um, but it looks like it might have crashed, but uh, that's a developing story. Well, that's of course, the re they can't land on the moon because it was all faked by Stanley Kubrick. So that, it's not going to happen, is it? You won't believe how many people I've had to say that to me, Ian. No. <laughs> oh, I'm, well, not, thought... I'm not going to. I'm not going to. St not going to rise to it. <laughs> I saw that documentary, Capricorn One. <laughs> <laughs> All we need to do is get a telescope out and look at the moon. <laughs> We've been there. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, but, uh, but is, is. Is that real? Tell, tell, I mean, I mean they they basically you know showed images of the Apollo landing sites with footprints and things, but are they real too? Or are they faked as well? Who knows? Definitely went. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, with a power, with power enough uh, domestic telescope, you can see evidence on the moon of, of, of things. <laughs> which are non yeah. That's anyway. what they want you to think. <laughs> been there. We've definitely been there. Yes. <laughs> Yes, well, unfortunately, I mean, I mean, the, the Apollo astronauts are now, now now dying off. So I think fairly soon, yeah. next five five years or so, we'll probably have no have none left. I think mean, uh, is it Charlie Charlie Duke? I think is the youngest one, and he's well in into in, in his eighties now. So um, yeah, yeah, fairly soon there won't be any left. Them. They'd be very yeah. sad. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> and again, again, this is one of the things about 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 the SpaceX Starship incident. Is that it's going to knock them back a bit. I mean, again, they, they can churn out these starships quite fast, but of course, NASA's planning to use one of those to take astronauts down to the moon. So, mm. and it's like you think, well, you were hoping to do that in the next few years. You know, they, they were saying 2024, 25, that's 26. I can remember the European, um, uh, the ESA uh, boss um, saying that he reckoned 2028 20, 20, 20, at the earliest. And I think that's looking more likely now. But we'll yeah. see. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, uh, the next SLS is due to launch with a crew. I think that's next year, and I think that's possible. And it's only going to do an Apollo 13 star loop. I think it's not going to go in, into orbit or anything. So uh, that should be relatively straightforward, uh, at least as straightforward as these things get, because it's obviously quite scary. <laughs> was it? Was it? I think it was John Young who said something along the lines of, you know, you know, scared. Well, you're sitting on top of an explosion, you know, a, a massive explosion, all this explosive chemicals that they're going to light and rocket you to several times the speed of sound. Yeah, if you're not scared. <laughs> there's something wrong with you. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so, very so true. Islam. So yeah, so uh, that, 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 that's the two, the two main space news uh, stories this week, which is obviously Starship going foom, uh, more, more like the launch by going foom. And sadly, as of right now, I'm just looking again at the latest updates. It's it's not looking good for, for the, the ice space lander, which is a real shame. Uh, but yeah, they'll try again. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Well, it's good to catch up with that and to catch up on the other stuff as well. Um, so I think that's just about everything we've got time for this week. So, uh, Gary, where can we find you? You can find me on the EV channel, um, which I'll be doing my fully charged uh, stand up. I'm hoping yep. to put two, a, a quick highlights together on Friday night and get it out so people can see what it is like before Saturday and Sunday. Um, whether I'll be able to do that or not, I don't know. <laughs> are, you, are, 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 you, are you attending the fully charged show? 
I am. I will be there, there on, on Saturday and probably on Sunday as well. I feel so on Friday and probably on Sunday as well. But on Saturday, I'm going to Aston Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Which is which is uh, an, another thing, another story entirely, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it should be good. Um, exactly. But yeah, definitely do it up. But well worth a visit to the farm, but yeah, absolutely. Right, well, I uh, will be back same time, same place next week. You can email me Ian at the and we'll see you then. Yeah, sure, yeah. Take care.